the world of how companies handle their data is changing rapidly, not just moving from on-premises servers to the cloud, but how companies are able to more quickly, more rapidly use that data in their businesses to improve their relationship with their customers, act more quickly as the data that they have informs the business decisions they need to make, the applications and the processes to get the most out of that data. I'm Jason Hall. This is Investing Unscripted. We're going to talk about one of my favorite stocks. It's a little company called Confluent that is growing very quickly. I want to talk about why, even though it had a wildly volatile 2023, I think right now it is a no-brainer stock to buy for 2024 and beyond. Before we get into the details, though, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas, go to our special link. Go to fool.com forward slash unscripted. The Motley Fool is going to give you its 10 best stocks to buy right now. You're definitely going to want to check that link out after this video. So we're going to start off with a screen share. I'm going to pull up Confluent stock price over the past year. It's always fun to take a look at what a stock's done recently. And you can see it has been some journey kind of climbing the mountain back to nowhere. The stock started roughly where it finished, up about 5%, so a little bit of a gain, but definitely an underperformance for the year and a huge drawdown from where the stock was in late summer when it peaked. Since its IPO, this is another one of those 2020, 2021 IPO stories, SPAC stories. This is a traditional IPO. A massive number of those stocks are still well down. This is another one. It's down by half from its IPO. We go to the, the post-IPO mania peak, absolutely crushed down 75%. Now, the thing is, the stock is down a ton. I think it's hard to argue that Confluence business is not in better shape than it was when the company went public. It is growing like wildfire acquiring more customers. Those customers are spending more and more money. We're going to talk about its business, the fundamentals of the growth trajectory, the market that it's pursuing, and whether or not the company is moving and how the company is moving in what I think is the right direction from a finances and a cash flows standpoint. We'll start with what Confluent is. And at its core, it is a business built on top of an open source tool called Apache Kafka. It's a data streaming tool. The founders of Confluent actually created it. Jay Kreps, June Rao are still two of the most important executives. Jay Krep, of course, the CEO and the co-founder of the company. June Rao is still very involved in the Apache Kafka community and a major tech mind behind that open source software. Now, again, the key is Confluent sits on top of Apache Kafka. and They've also built some custom tools. Kafka was originally built as a proximate tool, an on-premises tool for data streaming. Now, a lot of companies are moving their data to the cloud, as we know, whether it's at AWS, Azure with Microsoft, Google Cloud, and others. The folks at Confluent have built a cloud-native version of a Kafka that has become a very fast-growing part of the business. In this slide right here, again, Confluent platform still makes up about half of revenues. It has been, had been more than half of the company's business for most of its existence. That was the core product when they first launched. For services revenue, as they sell products, services to bring the products online, customize the environment, help customers shift to Confluent. But the big one here up in the top left, Confluent Cloud. This is currently a 46% portion of the business and it's growing rapidly. Now business is growing very quickly, but the growth is starting to slow. So we look at going back to 2022, revenue growth for the full year 2022 was better than 50% revenue growth. And then we see in 2023, we've only gotten the first three quarters of the year reported. Revenue growth has slowed to the low 30s percentage. Companies expecting revenue growth up between 20 to 25% in 2024. So we know the growth is beginning to slow. The key is that we know the best growth, the fastest growth continues to be Confluent Cloud. As more companies have shifted their data to the cloud, now they're looking for tools to help them unlock that data and get more use out of it. Data streaming is really powerful because this is real-time tools to be able to react to data, respond to data in real time as, you, as the data is coming in. Far better response rates, for, far more powerful for companies instead of using batch reporting to look at data that maybe has been sitting on a server for days, weeks, or even months. Companies are rapidly taking it on. Nowhere near those 2022 growth rates where the company was doubling revenue every single quarter but we're still looking at some incredibly high revenue growth rates, 61%. But just for context, last year, it more than doubled cloud revenue, more than doubled from where it was in 2021. Not going to grow at that same pace this year in 2023, but a really strong high growth product. 
I mentioned it before, but we'll talk about it again here. Just the mix of revenue. Again, we see prior to 2021, 2022, Confluent platform, the proximate uh, on the customer's own servers was by far the biggest portion of the business. And we see that is no longer the case. That is now less than half of total revenues as Confluent Cloud has grown at an incredibly rapid pace. And it still has that base of services revenue that it generates with each new customer contract. I mentioned at the beginning that it's steadily bringing on new customers and those customers are spending more money. This slide really breaks that out. Total customer count up 16% year over year through in the third quarter. In the third quarter, that means that its customers are steadily spending more money. Customers in two really important buckets, the 100,000 plus annual recurring revenue increased 25%, 1 million plus ARR increased 38%. So the key here is that still acquiring new customers at a very high rate, at a mid-teens rate, and customers are steadily spending more money. Customers sign on, they do small deals. Uh, a lot of it's led by developers and companies that use Kafka, that open source tool, and are looking as a company expands its use of it. They need more tools and resources and better tools. And Confluent is basically the vendor of choice when it comes to companies that use Kafka that want to scale it up and don't have the internal resources to do it, to develop the tools themselves, to manage the tools themselves. Confluent is the product of choice and the provider of choice for that. So it's showing out. Customers sign up, they start with small deals, they grow and they steadily spend more money as they integrate Confluent across more of their business and increase their use of it as a tool. As a result, the company is steadily seeing better and better profitability. Just looking at gross margins, revenue minus cost of revenue, we're seeing margins are steadily improving. Fiscal year 2021, less than 70%. In the third quarter, up to 76%. Subscription gross margin, and this is the core of what's going to be driving the business over time as it continues to scale up, is revenue from long-term contracts it signs with customers. That is its most profitable revenue at 80% plus gross margin. So real positives in terms of the profitability factor. This is a really important thing. I'm going to stop the screen share and just talk about this for a second. So many of the companies we saw that went public over the past couple of years, a massive number of those went public at the best time to do it when the market was most exuberant and they could raise the most money. A lot of them were doing it. The investors wanted to cash out. They were cashing out on public markets, leaving investors holding the bag, soaking up big losses. Now, the rare few other of those companies that went public during that time did it to maximize the amount of capital that they could raise specifically to aggressively fund growth initiatives. And I strongly believe that is the case with Confluent. You still have Jay Kreps, June Rao, other founders of the company that are still major shareholders and very involved in the company's operations and its long-term strategy. I feel like there's a tremendous amount of alignment there. They went public and raised this capital to aggressively spend to acquire growth. And we're starting to see it play out through the economics of the business. I think this is what's gonna to make, to me, where there's evidence that this is a just a, a almost no-brainer buy. You still have to be willing to invest in a very volatile stock in a company that is still burning cash and losing money based on the trends that look positive in those things and the market opportunity that's there. I think if you're the kind of investor that can deal with the risk and the volatility, this is where we're gonna talk about what makes Confluent really attractive right now. I'm gonna pull it back up on the screen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those economics. This is back where we left off and we see gross margin. Gross margins continue to improve. For these software-based businesses, this is such an important place to start because by and large, a lot of their fixed costs are relatively fixed and they don't scale up as their revenue increases so much. So things like sales, general and administrative expenses, the cost to run your home office, your sales and marketing department, R&D expenses, those things tend to be either fixed or a, the company tries to keep them at a certain percentage of revenues and they can scale those numbers up and down pretty easily. This isn't like an automaker with very high fixed costs where each car you sell, you have to make another car. If it's software, it's, well, you've already invested the money in the intellectual property, selling that new seat, that new license, the incremental costs are very low. So this is a really powerful model and seeing these mo margins continue to increase, I think is a real sign to me that the economic power of this business is starting to pay off. One of the places we can see that here is how operating expenses as a percentage of revenue are beginning to decline. If we look at this dark blue, and I want to point it out first, this is R&D. I think this is really important. This is one that we don't want to see it decline a tremendous amount. 
They have been pretty steady about continuing to spend on R&D and increasing that amount as revenue has gone up. Again, revenue has gone up a ton from 2021 to 2023. So they're spending more dollars. It's just a smaller percentage of revenue. Sales and marketing costs, we've seen that fall substantially as a percentage of revenue. And again, general administrative, your home office costs, basically, we've seen that fall significantly as well. As a result, operating margins were a massive negative 41% back in 2021, negative 5% operating margin in the third quarter. Still losing money, still burning money. But this is a really positive trend that we're seeing the improvement across, across the board here. We're also seeing stock-based compensation become less and less of a drag. There's a ton of the stock-based compensation that is still happening that comes back from pre-IPO stock options that we're going to still be dealing with for about another year and a half. And then the company says in the long term, net dilution should be less than 2% per year. My guess too is as the company begins to kick off free cash flow in future years, one of the things they'll do is start repurchasing shares to get to at least a neutral in dilution over the long term. So again, this trend is getting better. Less and less of the company is being awarded to employees and shareholders are being diluted less and less over time. So that's a positive. But right now that's a non-cash impact. And this is a company that does need to focus on preserving its cash. Let's talk a little bit about what it's doing with cash and its cash flows and what are the trends there. We've got a chart here from our friends at, at YCharts that I'm going to use that breaks down our cash flows. And we can see the data that we have from the S1 this goes back to the beginning of 2021, so actually before the company went public. And what I want to point out is you can see that the free cash flow, the purple line, and operating cash flow, the yellow orange line, it was a smaller cash burn before the company went public. But again, this is with intent. The company went public to raise cash, to aggressively spend, to acquire more market share and grow in the early days of the just explosion that we've seen in interest in data streaming tools. So as a result, over the past couple of years, the company has steadily spent more and more, even as revenue grew, grew at a very fast pace over the past few years, its cash burn increased. It was spending more and more cash. I've said it a hundred times. I'm going to say it one more time. This was with intent. The company chose to aggressively pursue a growth strategy and use the proceeds from its IPO to do that. Now we see, this is really what I wanted to focus on right here the trend is starting to reverse, okay? I showed a little bit of it when we were looking at some of the company slides, but I wanted to highlight it here because it shows clearly the company is slowing down its cash burn and is really beginning to focus on better unit economics, okay? Revenue has gone up, margins are improving, they're moderating their spend, getting to a steady state for SG&A, uh, R&D spend, those sorts of things. So every incremental dollar of revenue they generate is more valuable on the bottom line. And we're starting to see that pay off. Now, growth is starting to slow, right? So those incremental revenue dollars, there's going to be fewer of them coming in 2024 than in 2023 in prior years. So the question, how much money does the company have to continue burning before the strategy no longer is going to work? I've got good news for you. This is a company with a very strong balance sheet. I'm going to pull that up and we'll talk about that next. The purple line, that's cash. The orange yellow line, that's debt. So $1.87 billion in cash. This was at the end of the third quarter. And just under $1.1 billion in debt. So we're talking about almost $800 million in net cash, substantially more cash than the company is burning, which means that investors don't really have to worry about this being one of the company that in the higher interest rate environment, all of the stuff we've seen with venture capital freezing and IPO markets freezing and stocks down by half from its IPO price, they don't want to be doing a secondary. Good things they don't have to. So they have so much more cash than debt right now. And we can talk about that debt too. I think that's really important. Billion dollars in debt. A ton of debt. First of all, they have $1.8 billion in cash. So they have far more cash than debt, which means they can continue to consume cash as they focus on growing. So they don't have to starve the growth engine just to keep from running out of money. So that's really important. The other part of it too, is that the terms of the debt is just mind-bogglingly good because they issued the debt at the perfect time to do it. No interest rate on the debt. It's 0% interest and it's convertible debt. So an ideal situation would see the company be able to get to a point where generating positive cash flows, stock prices move back up and that debt they can actually convert to shares, continue to preserve cash. But worst case scenario, the stock price is, doesn't get back to a point in the near term where converting that debt to shares makes sense without wiping out investors in a big way. Guess what? They got plenty of cash that they'd be able to pay that debt down if they choose to just pay off 
that debt. Either way, I don't think it necessarily is going to be a big concern. The point is the company had continued to stick with the long-term focus strategy of spending to acquire market, to continue to grow, feeding the growth engine, not starving the growth engine, getting to the point where it can generate free cash flow per share and grow that in a substantial way over the long term. Talk about two things before we wrap up. First thing, market opportunity. We didn't really hit that very much, but there's a massive market the company is pursuing. I'm going to pull up a, a slide from its own presentation, talk about that next. This is the company's slide. They're using other companies' data. Gartner is one of the companies that feeds this data that they're using. So it's based in some reality. They're not just throwing a big number out there that sounds good. Gartner is pretty trustworthy when it comes to market data. Again, starting from a $60 billion TAM in 2022, company saying this is growing at a 19% CAGR. So $100 billion market in 2025. This is important. It's growing its revenue at a faster rate than the market. When they're growing the revenue faster than the market, they're taking share. And I think that's a really important thing. Can they continue to take share as the market grows? They're anticipating growing revenue 20 to 25% in 2024. So again, still growing their revenue faster than the CAGR for their market. That's a nice thing to see. Up next, let's talk about valuation just briefly. As a starting point, it's important to remember this is a company that's still losing money. It's still burning cash. So a lot of investors, myself included, I love to look at cash flow per share as a valuation metric. When the company's still burning cash, you can't really use that. You also don't have earnings, so you can't use earnings per share as a valuable metric as well. So this is a metric that I don't love to use, but I think it can at least give us a ballpark of valuation for a company like this. We're going to pull that up next. Value investing friends out there are probably losing their minds a little bit because yes, I am indeed using price to sales. And the reason why I want to use this is because we can look at some other big software companies out there. In this case, I'm using Microsoft, which is the cream of the crop. Also probably a little bit overvalued, even though they have massive growth with AI, the potential for AI in the cloud as they continue to grow their cloud business and deploy more AI tools through their enterprise software. Still probably a lot more growth than people might want to maybe acknowledge for Microsoft. But again, it's the best in class when it comes to software companies. So it can give us some sort of a ballpark for these really high margin, relatively low fixed cost businesses and thinking about trying to value that business over the long term. And you can see Confluent trades for you know, the stocks come down because the stocks come down so much, even as revenue has grown, trades for about nine times sales compared to nearly 13 times per sales for Microsoft. Now, again, I think 13 times sales for Microsoft is probably expensive, but as a proxy, it does at least give us some sort of a ballpark of thinking about how to value a company like Confluent. Now, the returns, they're still going to be based on the company's performance and execution because they're going to need to continue to reduce that cash burn, reduce stock-based compensation, while also maintaining really high margins and growing their customer base and growing their customer share. How much do those customers spend with them? Growing that relationship over time, becoming more sticky, embedded in that customer's business. As long as Confluent can continue to do that, the execution part, that's where you're going to win. But this at least helps us determine if this is a reasonable price to pay. And I think roughly nine times sales based on a massive addressable market, they're going to say that it's going to be a $100 billion market in 2025. Company's going to do maybe $900 million. Could If they blow it out, maybe they do a billion dollars in revenue this year. It's probably going to be closer to $900 million in revenue. This is a really big opportunity. This is a company that's executing well, signing up more customers. The customers are spending more money. They have a great balance sheet and they're doing a good job of leveraging the unit economics and getting their costs under control to get to that point where they're going to be generating positive cash flow. I think this is a great price for the business as long as they execute. And I think investors should be looking at buying Confluent right now.